Perfect. Cool. All right. Good morning. Thanks for making it out early. Uh, I know bad people aren't morning people, uh, or most bad people. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about, about some flight energetics of temperate bats. And this is some work I've been doing as a postdoc in Liam McGuire's lab at the University of Waterloo. So to start, I want everyone to think about running a marathon. Okay? Start, think about standing it there, the start line, the gun goes off. If you're like me, you're probably going to sprint out, be a little too ambitious, maybe overestimate your abilities. Then over the next minute or two, you're going to set into a nice steady state run. Right? Something that you're more comfortable running a longer distance on, a pace that you can min maintain, and something that your body can maintain well, uh, as well metabolically. Okay? Now, I'm sure you're also sweating because the idea of running 42 kilometers is a little scary. But this here is Kipajay Eliud, who I think should be considered the fastest man in the world. These are his split times for the marathon. He's the marathon record holder. He's running 42.195 kilometers in two hours and one minute, just under three minutes a kilometer sustained at uh, just under, sorry, yeah, just under three minutes a kilometer sustained for 42 kilometers, right? To me, this is outstanding. This is the fastest man in the world. No one else can hold this pace, okay? But what I want to focus on is this first split, and this is for five kilometers, but I want to think about what's happening with his body at the start of the race, okay? He's going to be going out from a standstill. You've warmed up, you've jumped, you know, done your little feet kicks, you've looked like a pro, all fancy, but you're standing, coming from a standstill. You're going to start running, and then you have to get into that pace, right? And we can start thinking about what's happening metabolically. What fuel source is fueling his running? So these are occurs, uh, standard of mammals, for two different uh, metabolic fuels. At the top here we have lipids, and the bottom here we have little carbohydrates. You look like a pro. And on the x-axis we have the You're exercise intensity. intensity. So you can think of 100% as your full out, the maximum exercise, the maximum intensity that you can be holding. Uh, and here we have the proportion of fuel sources. And this is standard of all mammals, and it's going to be true of Eliud uh, uh, as well here. At the start, when you're at your maximum energetic intensity, when you're starting out, you're sprinting, you're going real hard at that start, you're going to be fueling this exercise mainly on carbohydrates. But you can't use carbohydrates for high-intensity exercise over long periods of time. It, as your exercise... Um, uh, as you go on, and, sorry, as you go on and uh, you're not at your maximum anymore, you start to use lipids, okay? Your uh, carbohydrate usage is going to decrease because you can't sustain that high-intensity exercise for two hours over 42 kilometers. So what's really amazing when you look back at these times is you can actually be running this marathon at full intensity. This is more like a great jog for this man, which makes it even crazier that he's doing this jog in three minutes. Now, when we talk about mammals as a whole, there's three main fuel sources that we can be talking about. And I just introduced two of them, the carbs and the lipids. And the carbohydrates are going to be fueling this high-intensity, short-duration exercise. Okay? Carbohydrates are really low in uh, energy density. We burn through them as mammals really quick. And once those reserves are gone, we've got to switch over to our lipids. Lipids are going to fuel more moderate-intensity exercise. You can hold this for longer durations. They're much more concentrated in their energy density at wet mass and at dry mass. Uh, and this is really what's fueling that long duration exercise. So things that when we're going for a run, when we're going for long swims, when you're playing that long volleyball or, or tennis game, uh, match. And in emergencies, we resort to proteins. Okay? We don't use proteins. They're really more of an emergency reserve. In order to get proteins from the body, you've got to start breaking down tissues, muscle, uh, and your organs, okay? So this is great. We know this works. <clears throat> but the question starts to get trickier when we start talking about bats, okay? Bats are, of course, the only group of mammals that are going to be flying. Flight, we know metabolically, per unit time is the most energetically costly form of locomotion. And bats have to fly at a high intensity, always. You can't slow down, okay? Um, I should have thrown it up here, but we know that as a, a bat, as a flying animal, as they slow down in their flight speed, it actually takes more energy for them to stay flying. Okay? So they need to stay at this high intensity. Going down to this moderate intensity isn't an option. But they're also going to be running out of this fuel source, these carbs, real quick. 
So obviously bats are doing something a little bit different. And if we look in comparative studies and we go over to birds, we know that birds fuel long duration flights on lipids. They're using the high intensity exercise to be fueled by lipids uh, in this other flying animal uh, group, taxa. Okay? So maybe bats are doing something similar. This here, just to give you an idea of this flight that's fueled by lipids, is the bar-tailed godwit. It's going to fly from Alaska down to New Zealand, nine days, non-stop flight. And they're fueling this basically on lipids. So we're starting to study uh, energetics in animals, and particularly in flying animals. There's a number of methods that can be used to study energetics. One is doubly labeled water. I'm not going to get into the details, you know, exact details of all these methods, but the idea with doubly labeled water is that you're going to need to inject an animal, recapture it 24 to 48 hours later. So you can imagine everyone here who's caught bats going back and trying to catch that same animal 48 hours later to get another measurement reading. Not the most practical uh, for bats. Uh, and you're also going to get a field metabolic rate. So this isn't just looking at the flight periods, but it's also the inactive periods, the active periods, the grooming, allo grooming, all the movement, walking around within a uh, roost. So for us, looking at flight energetics, not the best. You can use respirometry as well, classic flow through respirometry. You need to have an animal in the chamber, and you can only be getting a metabolic rate at that time. Um, you can also use masks for a bat flying around with a mask on its face. Not the most practical, although people have attempted it. And the method we're using is the 13C bicarbonate method. Uh, which I'll explain a little bit more in a second. Basically, we get nice washouts within hours, right? It doesn't affect the animal long term. Uh, you can reuse the animals over successive days because uh, it's minorly invasive. Uh, and um, yeah, and the biggest part though is that you can get a metabolic estimate with the animal being unrestrained. So for studying flight, it's a great method to be using. So the bicarbonate method has been used in bats before in other studies, largely by Christian Voigt's group out of Germany. So this is just one example <coughs> excuse me, of some metabolic flight data. Uh, this study was looking at the cost of rain and bats flying in rain. Uh, so on the uh, x-axis here, you have dry animals, animals that were wet, but it wasn't raining while they were flying in this experiment, and then wet and rain, where they simulated rain, the animal was getting wet as it flew. And basically, here we have the metabolic rate, and we can see that when the animal's wet, it increases their metabolic rate. Okay? Likewise, here's another study uh, looking at the cost of flying during the day. Right? And they're talking about the body temperature of the animal heating up, having a higher metabolic rate when it's flying during these light periods and these warmer periods. Uh, and basically, just the metabolic rate is going to be increasing during the day. So these are just a couple studies that have looked at flight energetics in the past um, using this similar method. <coughs> The big thing with these studies and a lot of studies with bat flight, they occur over one to two minutes of flight. I don't think I need to tell everyone here that bats can fly for more than one or two minutes, right? And this is where we start to think back to that marathon question. What's happening at the start of the marathon versus once you get into that steady state uh, activity, that steady state exercise? Something probably a little bit different than what's happening in these first two minutes in these flight experiments. So we wanted to use the bicarbonate method to get into asking these questions about longer duration flights. So this bicarbonate system runs on uh, the natural buffer pool of the body. We're gonna talk about this real quick. We don't have to understand it's super, super intense physiologically, but just to give a quick refresher, we know that energy is metabolized. So in this example, this is uh, glucose metabolism. And basically for all the oxygen we take in, whoop, that's a big error. Um, that, that's, that's oxygen, uh, there should be a two. Uh, we have six, ox, uh, six CO2 produced, okay? And when the CO2 is produced with water, carbon dioxide, water, form a bicarb, uh, bicarbonic acid, and we don't want acid going through our blood system, so it's quickly uh, converted to bicarbonate and a proton, which is picked up by our hemoglobin. The idea here is that bicarbonate and CO2 are constantly in flux, right? They're in nice equilibrium They're in, uh, in our body going back and forth. And that's the basic uh, idea I want you to take away right now. And I'm going to show you some nice data that when we inject animals with bicarbonate, we can measure their CO2. Okay? So for these uh, experiments, we're using wild bats from southern Ontario, caught uh, 
a handful in Aberfoyle, Ontario, and then a handful caught in a variety of different buildings on McMaster campus. Uh, so these are all wild caught animals. They're not escapees from Paul's colony. Uh, they are wild animals. Paul was generous enough to let us hold them uh, in a facility here for the durations of the experiment. And uh, what we do with these flight experiments, uh, at the start we inject them with uh, 13C bicarbonate. Right, so heavy bicarbonate. Uh, well, sorry, I should, I should clarify with uh, 12C. Oh, I'm out of the camera, sorry. Uh, with 12C uh, uh, being the more prevalent isotope. Uh, so this here we're labeling it with the unprevalent isotope and look at ratios, right? So sorry, I should clarify that. Uh, we then put the animal in a respirometry chamber. We're able to look at their isotope analysis, uh, get some data. This is all from their breath. This is all the CO2 that they're breathing out. We're then able to fly the animals for two, five, eight, or 11 minutes. So those past experiments, I said, they're all looking at two minutes flight, roughly. We're trying to extend this out to longer periods of flight. They were able to look at their isotope analysis afterwards as well. So this is me. I've set up uh, a little makeshift lab in the back of a building here on Alumni House at McMaster Campus. Uh, you can wander over if you wish in the rain afterwards. Uh, the lab is not there anymore, but you can still wander over. So this is the building. We got our lab set up in this little garage. Uh, Alumni Services was, was super generous with us. Uh, and when we hung out there all night, um, here's a little greenhouse we set up to be moving animals in and doing injections in, uh, so they're not just out in the garage. And we're able to use a little gazebo at the back, 15 and a half by 15 and a half gazebo to fly these animals. We lined it with vapor barrier to prevent animals from landing. They just keep flying and flying and flying. Uh, it's a beautiful, nice place to hang out there at night. Lots of wildlife. You have deer, raccoons, skunks. Sometimes you find the odd intoxicated undergrad. Um, but yeah, so we were out here from about 7, 8 o'clock when sunset was happening out to about 3, 4, 5 a.m. depending on the night. So hoping this works. You can see that we got a bat here flying around, and these bats will just fly. They go around and around. The one bat flew for a solid 11 minutes straight, but it works well. They don't like the vapor barrier. It's too slippery for them to land on uh, and actually uh, get into with their claws to hold. Uh, they just fly in circles. This is a, I mean, it's beautiful when you stand there and you're watching it, it's majestic. If you have the vo volume on, you can hear me myself and, and Jod Hughes here helping me outside the gazebo going, I'm so proud of him. He's beautiful. It's so majestic. <laughs> but the bats fly around. And then this is what we're doing right afterwards. We're going, we're putting them right back in that respirometry chamber. Basically with that isotope, you're going to see when we inject them with that bicarbonate, the CO2 ratios in their breath is going to peak and it's going to decay nicely. This big gap is where we're taking them out and flying them. And then we're able to get an isotope ratio after. You can imagine if they didn't fly, this would decay nicely, but instead it's moving, the curve's shifting down, and we're able to do a bunch of fancy math, put it into R, say a few cuss words, yell at my computer, do a little bit more statistics, and in the end we get one nice beautiful graph. Uh, so this is hot, hot off the press this week. Uh, this is basically our raw uh, metabolic rates in the volume of CO2 produced. Uh, and we have our flight durations here on the x-axis. This isn't accounting for yet, body mass of the animals. We had a repeated measure design. Um, animals do sometimes flutter down to the ground, take a little bit of a break. We haven't accounted it with those videos for all those little breaks yet, but this is the raw data. And some of the big stuff we can see right off the bat is a decrease in the variance uh, of the metabolic rate over longer durations of flight. To me, this suggests, kind of like that marathon, that we're starting to get into a more steady state flight and the metabolism of these bats changes when we start looking at flight durations outside of this two period range. The other thing we can be doing and look at, and I talked about before, is this lipid versus carb question. I don't have data on that yet. I worked my ass off this week and I didn't get it for you, sorry. But we do have the data to get that information. And what I'm going to suspect is at the start here, the bats are using carbohydrates. And as we get into longer duration flights, you're going to switch over to lipid usage. Right? 
And already, uh, we know that you know, with the uh, CO2 output, you're going to be outputting less CO2 when you're using lipid metabolism. This decrease here is kind of starting to suggest that already. So some things we've been doing with this flight research in the future, we can look at the fattening of bats prior to hibernation. How is this going to be impacting their flight? Right? You ought to get fat, but obviously at a certain point you can't get fatter or you can't fly. Right? Offspring overload. These bats are also be flying around with pups 30% of their body mass. Okay? And we can start looking at ratios and radio tags, revisiting that 5% rule. And we can look at it from an energetic cost, an energetic perspective. How much does a little bit of variance in that radio tag we're putting on an animal actually influence its energetics? So these are all questions we're going to go forward through in the future, uh, and I'm going to keep pursuing over the next couple of years of my postdoc. So I just want to thank everybody, uh, Liam uh, McGuire, my postdoc supervisor, Jod, uh, who is a master's student at McGill, and Paul, who's uh, let us uh, use this colony, and everyone else. I definitely need to thank uh, Gwyn and Lily, who came out and helped me catch these animals, and Shane and Kazuma, who would text me in the morning and be like, don't worry, I fed your animals, don't rush in, and let me get a couple extra hours of sleep uh, on those like, late night mornings. Thank you. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right, so we are running a little bit behind time, but we can have one question for Lucas. Any burning question? Up, up? Okay, we have one. How did you select the flight duration? And, and what's a typical, what is the thought of a flight direction or a flight duration for a So uh, how do you choose the flight duration for a study? Honestly, we're going off two minutes for um, past studies, right? And then we're trying to increase into long, longer duration flights. We said, you know, if we had a couple minutes, it might be at that real border between what we expect for carb lipid. And then we just wanted to get into what would be a longer extension uh, flight. So we got up to like the 11 minutes. So there's some guesswork in there. Uh, just going nice intervals, but we're building off those old studies at two minutes. Um, some of those studies looking at the carb lipids there are suggesting that they're still using carbs after those two minutes. So we just really wanted to make sure we hit that transition period and the position uh, and the time periods afterwards. Um, in the wild, man, they can fly, but like for, for time and for distance, they'll, they'll, fly, they'll fly for half an hour easy. I mean, I can't, I, I, I want to say hours, but I can't give you a study if you ask me that said, oh, yeah, they tracked this animal four hours. Um, but they, they, 10 minutes is not a problem for them. Uh, the, bigger, the bigger issue with any of these longer duration flights is that you reach the time where the animal tells you to screw off. I can't get out of here. Uh, as opposed to any actual fatigue for the animal. Thanks. Okay. We're